Berwick Public Library, we have a really exciting program tonight. Always, 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 the hardest part of my job, and probably Roxy's too, is technology. So we're over the hump, we're ready, and I wanted to welcome Roxy Zwicker. We are going to have her talk about ghosts from the coast. She is your guide tonight to look at the water, turbulent waters of the local shores and the creepy happenings along our coast. We're going to look at haunted lighthouses and other tales and legends for this area. It should be really fun. I don't want to take up a lot of time. I do want to just thank BCTV for their continued support of filming our programs so people can see them afterwards. And it's such a great partnership. So thank you, BCTV, for all you do for the public library. Welcome, Roxy. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks so much. Um, it's so nice to be able to see you. Last year when I did my presentation, we were all in little tiny boxes. Yes. So this is really comfortable it and wonderful. Nice. And thank you to all of you for coming out this evening. Um, so I run New England Curiosities over in Portsmouth and I've been doing ghost tours of the Seacoast for about 21 years. And you're gonna hear some of my favorite haunted places on the coast. And if you're not a big believer in ghosts, all that I ask is that you have an open mind. It's gonna be like a little bit of a virtual tour as we make our way around. Um, and thank you for your patience while we were setting up. All right. So what is it about ghosts that intrigue us so? And why are so many stories connected to the sea? I mean, that's how we got here. That's how they came to the new world was via the sea. And a lot of us tend to romanticize what it was like to be out there sailing across the ocean, coming to this new world. But some of the things that people have encountered over the years, everything from storms to islands popping up out of nowhere, have really left a lot of ghost stories and tales of legends and lore in their wake. And I think there's always an imagination sometimes when we look out to the sea and wonder, is there anything still out there? Where have some of these ships gone? Where have some of these ghost stories gone over the years? So the sea is very intriguing and all the mysteries therein. Of course, one of the things that we often see as we make our way around New England in the old burial grounds are so many gravestones that tell us stories of those who had gone out to the sea and did not return. So here is a beautiful gravestone. This one's actually in Newburyport with which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. So here we have a sea captain's daughter who was lost at sea and she is leaning on an anchor and it's funny how there is that double meaning that you have here and she's pointing to the hourglass to remind you of how much time we have left. This is a gravestone that is up in Rockland, Maine. I actually visited this past winter and it's for Captain George Jordan. And really hard to tell from some of these gravestones because they don't always give you all of the information or all of the story. But Captain George Jordan actually was lost at sea along with this ship. It was called the Pacific. And it was really just days after the ship had left Liverpool on its way to New York that it was lost at sea. And it was about 50 years later, remnants of the ship were found on islands and there were no crew members that had survived. But there's really not a whole lot on these gravestones to tell you. And I always find those are the stories that I'm always digging into. Just outside of Portsmouth is a tiny island of Newcastle. Newcastle actually used to be part of Portsmouth right up through the 1680s. And one of the things that I love about Newcastle is all you have to do is just do some beach combing and you're going to delve into some of the maritime history and some of the lost stories that are over there. So back in the 1970s and 1980s, a father and son dive team were diving off of Newcastle Island along the Piscataqua Channel. And for about 15 years, they were pulling up all sorts of fascinating remnants that essentially were embedded right in the seabed. These are some of the things that they pulled up here and they're actually on display at the museum in Newcastle, which I highly recommend a visit. 
And it really gives us an idea of some of the ships that were sailing the coast going all the way back to the 1600s. They pulled up a cannon that was dated from the 1630s, embedded in the sand just off of Newcastle Island. So it's pretty amazing that just under our feet or just under the water, there are still all of these remnants of people that sailed our shores. One of the things that people often ask about are the animal bones or the livestock bones. And if we go back to the 16 and 1700s, one of the things that's important to remember is a lot of these ships actually had livestock on them because they needed them at sea. So sometimes you'll get these really ancient animal bones that'll wash ashore. So of course, this is beautiful Whaleback Lighthouse and we're looking at it from the Great Island Common, again, out on Newcastle. Whaleback Lighthouse is actually owned by the town of Kittery and it's an important navigational lighthouse as you're coming up around Kittery Point. So of course, on the left would be Portsmouth Harper Lighthouse, which we'll talk about in just a little while. And on the right would be Whaleback. Whaleback is on a ledge out there um, at Kittery Point. So, Whale back, you can sort of imagine back in the day, lighthouse keepers living right inside the tower. You know, there was usually a lighthouse keeper and an assistant. And it was a really difficult life. And there always had to be someone that was on the job. So here is a look at Whaleback Lighthouse from Fort Foster in Kittery, which there is said to be a woman in red who wanders the beach of Fort Foster at night. She's described as coming out at sunset. And again, she's right in the shadow of Whaleback Lighthouse. The lighthouse itself is just off of the Wood Island Life Saving Station. And I recently spoke to Sam Reed, who is the president of the Wood Island Life Saving Station. And he told me an interesting story about some items that were found right out there on Wood Island. Because before the Life Saving Station was built, back in the late 17 and early 1800s, this was a quarantine island. In fact, as you make your way along the Piscataqua, you'll see all of these different islands there. And a lot of them were used for people that were ill, whether it was scarlet fever, whether it was dysentery, they were actually shipping people out there to either survive or die. And not everybody survived. So Sam had told me back in 1972, two skeletons were found out on Wood Island that dated back pre the Wood Island Life Saving Station. They believe it was early 1800s, and there were two people that were brought out there essentially to survive their illness and did not. I asked him about the ghosts at Wood Island Life Saving Station, if in fact it was haunted. And he said if it was haunted, it was haunted by very happy spirits that were out there. He said he hasn't heard anything, but he always sort of felt that whoever was out there was happy with the work that was being done because the Life Saving Station is indeed currently being restored. And um, there will be access to go out to the island, so that's very exciting. For the first time, people will actually be able to go and spend some time out there. But sort of the purpose of the Wood Island Life Saving Station was, back in the days before the Coast Guard, any mariner that was in distress, essentially, these men would climb into rowboats, row out to them in the worst of conditions, and try to save them. They even worked with some of the lighthouse keepers over at Whaleback. So if you can sort of imagine what it was like to be a keeper, this story is from 1886 and the lighthouse keeper that was out there at the time was facing a severe storm. While it's beautiful on a bucolic day like that, back during that severe storm, waves were washing up and over the top of the lighthouse. It was so bad. In fact, all of the glass in the lantern room and the glass in the tower were broken. The keeper and the assistant were washed out into the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Only one of them survived, and unfortunately, the one who was lost was the head keeper, and he left a young family on shore. Today, the lighthouse is automated. It leaks like a sieve. However, a lot of mariners, even today, fishermen, lobstermen, while they have all sorts of modern navigational equipment, satellite, Loran, they still do use these lighthouses, even as day markers, to find their way along the coast. And it's really kind of funny when we go back to the early days of the lighthouses, back in the early 1800s, imagine being out on the sea, no moon, just stars if you're lucky, trying to navigate our coast with all of the inlets and all of the treacherous coves therein. These lighthouses were really just so very important. So we'll scoot up here to Star Island so Star Island to me is really one of the most magical and one of the most haunted places on our coast. I've been very lucky over the years to have been able to go out to Star Island and hear a lot of stories from people that actually work out there and volunteer out there. And it is like stepping back in time. 
even at the Oceanic Hotel, there's no phones in the rooms, there's no TVs. It's just you, the ocean air, the legends and lore of the island, and whoever happens to be walking by. So here's a, another view of the Oceanic Hotel here as you step off the boat from Portsmouth. Now the Oceanic Hotel is a fantastic place to stay, but it also has its share of legends and lore. And I was quite surprised um, a few years ago when I stayed there that they actually allowed me to wander about the hotel and to do some exploring. And while I was hoping to find a lot of ghosts out there, I was very surprised at how entertaining it was out there. So there is a section of the hotel up on the upper floor. It's actually called Ghost Alley. And there's a sign on the door that says Ghost Alley. In fact, now they sell t-shirts on Star Island that say Ghost Alley Guaranteed Haunted. Some of the ghost stories that you'll hear from the upper section of the hotel. So sort of that section up there on the right hand side. Guests will say they hear calliope music. Folks that work there say they see orbs real time. They see shadow people, the shadows of figures moving throughout the building, but you never see anyone casting those shadows. What's fascinating about Ghost Alley, again, being that upper floor is it's not a section for the public. It's actually for the pelicans that work there. So the, well, the pelicans are the, the seasonal folks. Oh, okay. I, I know it's funny when I mention pelicans, I'm like, wow, there's pelicans work out there. Uh, but that's actually what they call the seasonal workers. They call them pelicans or pels. So those are their rooms for the summer. And it's just very fascinating how haunted they say it is. But that is not the only haunted spot on the island. So here we are. Looking back at sunset, of course, over towards Rye, New Hampshire. And just off in the distance here, you can see White Island Lighthouse, which I'll give you a couple of stories about in just a moment. So here is the Caswell Cemetery, and there's several cemeteries that are out on Star Island. So here we're looking at the beautiful Gosport Church here as we make our way around the island at dawn. Let me see if I can view a view of the sign that's in here. So here's another view of the church. What's fascinating is a little bit about the church. So here is the sign that's in the church and it tells you that the Gosport Church was originally constructed of the timbers of the wreck of a Spanish ship in 1685. The church was rebuilt in 1720 and burned by the islanders in 1790. The building of stone was erected in 1800, so the original church was actually burned down by fishermen who were trying to stay warm out there because there really weren't a lot of trees out on the island. But the first church was actually built out of ship timbers, which is quite fascinating to me. That waste not, want not, they saved everything from any wreck that was out there. So as you go from behind the buildings, on Star Island, there is this incredible gate, and it sort of brings you out to a little bit of a section of wild land out there. Now, the first charting of the Isles of Shoals actually happened in the late 1500s by Captain John Smith. And at one time, the whole area was actually called Smith's Isles. Star Island got its name because of its shape of looking like a star. But when you wander out here, it truly is like, again, walking back in time even a little bit more because there's not really a lot of buildings that are out here. So here is one of the paths. As you're walking along off in the distance, you can see White Island Lighthouse. However, as we make our way to the end of this path, you'll see, let me go back here, you'll see that there is this little obelisk out there. And this was all grown over until about 15 years ago. You couldn't even see this small cemetery. And this is the BB Cemetery. The BB Cemetery is for three children, Jesse, Millie, and Mitty. And their father was actually the minister out on Star Island. And two of the children went to school on the mainland. One of them became sick, came back to the island, got their siblings sick, and all three children passed away. The minister, Minister Beebe, decided to leave the island and he went up, of course, to the White Mountains, completely heartbroken. So here's a, another look here, hopefully. You can see there's their, their little stones out there. So as I said, for many, many years, this was completely overgrown. You almost couldn't even find it. And again, as we looked at that previous picture, the pathway appeared to go nowhere. But on the other side 
are these gravestones. And if you talk to the folks out on Star Island, they'll tell you that for years you could hear laughter coming from the graveyard here. And sometimes there are actually reports of seeing children running around. So of course now they've cleared it off so you can really see what it looks like down there. But this is an old photograph of what the burial ground actually looked like when it was first established back in the late 1800s after the children were buried. And again, you can sort of see how barren it was out there on Star Island. So this is the walkway that connects from Star Island out to Smutty Nose Island. And Smutty Nose is still a bit infamous out there. A lot of people talk about this story and debate what exactly happened out there on Smutty Nose Island in the late 1800s. So this is a man named Lewis Wagner and he was known to the folks out on the Isles of Shoals, specifically on Smutty Nose Island. That is the infamous axe that was used in the double axe murder that inspired both the book of the movie, The Weight of Water by Anita Shreve. According to the story, Lewis Wagner climbed into a rowboat, rowed nine miles out to Smutty Nose Island, murdered two of the three women that were out there, sat down, had a sandwich, and then rowed all the way back to Portsmouth in that boat, all within a very short time frame. There was snow on the ground, it was March, and people wondered, did he really manage to commit that murder and the round trip out there just for the sum of about $20? There were a lot of theories that it was actually the one surviving woman who lived to tell the tale who had actually climbed through a window, hidden a cleft of rock in the snow, in the cold, who claimed that Lewis Wagner had done the murder. Now, Lewis had a bit of a checkered past. In fact, when he was questioned, he was arrested, imprisoned in Boston, and he escaped, which made him look even a little bit more guilty than people had originally guessed. Lewis was brought to trial and he was found guilty of the double murder. This is a stereo view photo. You can see Lewis in the wagon there being accompanied by two men. And Lewis is heading off to his final destination. He was executed by hanging in the state of Maine for committing the double murder. But again, tongues still wag today. In fact, the ax that you just saw in the previous image, you can actually find and cast an eye on for yourself. It's actually located in downtown Portsmouth at the Portsmouth Athenaeum, which is right in Market Square. It's a private library that was established in 1817, and they have some amazing artifacts that are there. They even have a vial of blood that was found on uh, some battlefield back in the day where someone decided to preserve that. But the axe is on display, and when I went out to the Star Island, um, probably about three or four years ago, they were actually having a weekend symposium just on the axe murder. And there were a lot of different theories that were being explored. Um, one of my favorite questions kept coming up a lot, which was, if we have the axe that was used in the murder, and today we have DNA evidence, why can't we take the axe and figure out whose DNA is on it? Well, the problem was in the late 1800s, when the axe was taken off the island, it was put on the back of a boat and it was washed with salty seawater. So this was back in the days before CSI. So by the time the axe got to Portsmouth, it was totally clear of anything that it could tell us. But it still sits there in the Athenaeum for everyone to view. Roxy, can I add something to that? Sure, absolutely. So we had a program here at the library a few years ago on um, this money nose murder. Mm -hmm. and um, Dennis Robinson has done extensive research on it, so there's a, a very factual, well-researched book that we have, and it's called Mystery of the Isle of Shoals, Closing the Case of the Smutty Nose mm -hmm. Murders. Absolutely. So, I wanted to just preface your... Absolutely. So if you can't sleep tonight because you came to this event, then grab that book and you can stay up all night and read it. It's, I mean, Dennis is great. No, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a great book, but I'm going to give you a little homework beyond that, too. Okay. You want to go to the Harmony Grove Cemetery in Portsmouth, where the two axe murder victims are actually buried. So here they are, Aneth Matea and Karen Ann Christensen. Um, a lot of people will contact me looking for specific graves in Portsmouth, and I don't always know where all of them are, but these two often are ones that people want to go and sort of connect with and pay their respects. You'll notice that they have the broken rose on each, and that's to signify a life that was cut short. As you can see, people leave trinkets and notes and little memorials on the stones themselves. 
Now, um, Harmony Grove is part of the South Cemetery in Portsmouth, so it's on the corner of South and Sagamore Ave, and there's a lot of ghost stories all around the cemetery that have been persisting for many, many years. Everything from glowing gravestones that glow at a particular time of night to other stories of people trying to conjure spirits in the bushes with Ouija boards, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. However, people want to go in there and see what they can find out. So um, if you are interested in that story, again, if, if you get to sort of the end of the trail or the end of the book, it's always worth going and just paying a visit to the grave for these two women, who are both, by the way, from Norway. All right, so one of my favorite stories as we work our way up the coast is that of the Nottingham Galley. So we're just off of the coast of York. So if you are standing on York Beach and you look out, there is a little scrap of rock that just sticks out of the water, sort of on your way back from the Isles of Shoals. So the wreck of the Nottingham Galley happened in 1710. Today you'd know the island because there is a lighthouse on it. But back in 1710, there was nothing there but essentially seagulls and seaweed and a scrap of rock. So the Nottingham Galley wrecked on the island and the men tried to survive by eating what they could find. Seagulls and seaweed. Their stomachs reacted quite violently and the first person to die was actually the cook. And well, I don't know if you've had dinner yet, but the story might change the events for the evening here for you. So the men tried to survive. They tried to put together what they could from the ship putting together boards to try to make a raft because they could see there was York Beach. However, as soon as they climbed aboard the raft, no one saw them again. And the days were drawing on and there was no help in sight. So the captain was faced with quite a decision. Here he had these hungry, starving men, no food in sight, and he had the dead body. So he decided to make the decision to carve up the dead body and use it as a food source. Many of the men being God-fearing men said, absolutely not, that's cannibalism, we're not going to partake in that. But it was either that or imminent death. As the weeks went on, the next person to die was the carpenter, and his body was also used as a food source. The men from the Nottingham Galley were stranded on that scrap of rock for 28 days until January of 1711, until they were finally rescued. At that point, their fingers, their toes, their noses were suffering from severe frostbite. And the captain ended up sailing down off the coast of Massachusetts and never set foot in another boat again. So the decision was made to build a lighthouse out there on the island to warn any mariners that this ledge of rock would be a hazard out there. So this is the first presidential declaration for the lighthouse out on Boone Island. As you can see, it was signed by President John Adams in 1799. However, it took a few years for the first lighthouse to be built. The first lighthouse was only there for a very short period of time, just a few years when it fell into the ocean. A second lighthouse was built. That also fell into the ocean. And then a third lighthouse. That's how perilous it is out on Boone Island. So a third lighthouse was built out on Boone Island. It's one of the tallest in New England. And a lot of people say that it is one of the most haunted lighthouses in New England as well. The stone is dovetailed together and that really helps and reinforces when the waves are rolling over the island or even the boulders are rolling over the island during storms that the lighthouse actually braces upon itself. Now there are a lot of strange tales that come from Boone Island. One of my favorites is from the 1880s and there was a lighthouse keeper family out there at the time and it just so happens a storm was rolling in and the lighthouse keeper knew his only way off of the island was to make sure that his boat was secure. So he went out in the middle of the storm, was tying up his boat, slipped on the wet rocks and hit his head. His wife had seen what happened and she went out to assist him. When she went out to assist him, she realized that he was unconscious. So she decided to bring him into the base of the lighthouse, which is roughly when you're inside about nine feet around. She was trying to get him to come too, but meanwhile, it was now her duty to keep the light lit. You didn't just plug in lighthouses. You actually had to light the light, trim the wick, use oil. So she climbed the 167 spiral staircases to the top of that tower for the next eight days to keep it going. All the while, sitting back down on the bottom of the lighthouse trying to get her husband to come too. On the ninth day, the storm had blown out. 
she had run out of fuel. The mariners were going by the lighthouse and they noticed something did not seem right out there. The light was out and nobody was around. So they clambered onto the island and went right inside the base of the tower and there she was, still holding on to her husband's hand. However, she didn't realize that when he hit his head, it was actually fatal and he had died instantly. And for those eight days, she was holding his essentially cold, dead, frozen hand. She wasn't even taking care of herself during that time. And when she was taken off the island, she died within two weeks from exposure. So as the years went on out at Buna, and this photograph here um, is from roughly around the 1950s. You can look in the distance way off, you can see the land. And that of course is York Beach. And even further than that, you can see Mount A or Mount Agamenticus there. So now you have a little bit of a perspective on the island out there. This is one of the lighthouse keeper families. Um, in the late 1800s, and it really was a family affair. Um, one of the lighthouse keeper's children, they actually still have her journal, and she could see the beach again in the distance, and she wrote in her journal that being on Boone Island, she felt like she was being kept prisoner from the rest of the world out there. Celia Thaxter, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with her name, of course, she's associated with being a poet and a gardener out on the Isles of Shoals. She wrote that Boone Island was one of the most forlorn places that she could imagine. So again, here's a little bit of information on the lighthouse. So it was built in 1855. The stone tower built of granite is 133 feet high. It's the tallest lighthouse in New England. It's 25 feet in diameter at its base and 12 feet in diameter at the top. What's interesting about being on the outside of the lighthouse at its base is again when storms roll in they throw up all these rocks that you can see on the island up against the base of the lighthouse and it's pockmarked from all the storms that are out there. So again here's a, another view um, again about 1950s or so of the island. However, I don't know if all of you were around, and you don't have to say if you were, during the blizzard of 1978. The blizzard of 78 really wreaked havoc on Boone Island. So much so, every single building that we just saw in those previous images were all washed into the ocean. So that is what remains out there on Boone Island. In fact, the Coast Guard had to go out and rescue people by helicopter during the blizzard of 78. The island floods all the time, and the only way to keep that tower lit is actually by solar panels. You can't even run electricity out there. So who's telling the ghost stories out on Boone Island? The Coast Guard. The Coast Guard say that cats and dogs refuse to go in the tower. They say that sometimes you can hear a woman's voice shouting across the island and there's nobody there. Also a little bit stranger than that and a little bit more grim is sometimes migrating birds will get lost in the storms and they can't see the lighthouse, so they'll smash into the tower. And sometimes when the Coast Guard go out onto the island, they're knee deep in dead seabirds that have lost their way and gotten disoriented and crashed into the tower. But if you are standing on York Beach, you want to look for a little matchstick. And that little matchstick on the horizon is Boone Island. So New England is home to over 5,400 known shipwrecks. So here's a little close up on a National Geographic map that shows you where some of those are along our coast here. So going from uh, Rockport to York Harbor and they're being discovered still all the time, which is always amazing how um, we think we, we know, you know some of these stories and yet they keep unearthing themselves. So this is down on um, York Beach. I'm sure uh, a lot of you remember in the news a few years ago, after a storm, the sand had receded so much that embedded in the beach was actually a ship. And it was determined after further examination that it was a sloop. So here you can see what it would have looked like. And here's a closer image. This photo is actually from the Ports of Herald. And you can see there it is. And if you go down to the beach now, it's still there, but the sand has now covered it back up. So know that as you're walking on the beach down there, that there is actually a ship that is embedded underneath all of that sand. So it has to be the right conditions to reveal this. And um, again, even as I was mentioning earlier in Newcastle, sometimes we just don't know what relates to our maritime history that's embedded, again, down in the seabed or even sort of lost in the sand there. But it is um, pretty well preserved. And uh, we'll just have to sort of keep an eye to uh, the next major winter storm to see if it chooses to reveal itself yet again. 
So we're going to go up to um, Kennebunk Port for this next story. And this is one of my favorite stories, one of the earliest stories that I learned on the seacoast as it relates to a ghost ship. And um, just last year at this time, I actually stopped over to the location where the shipwreck had actually happened. And um, the folks that were there were all too eager to tell me ghost stories from the property and also that related to the area where the ship had washed ashore. So Kennebunkport has um, just such an amazing maritime history. And when I went to take this um, sequence of photos, I tried to take it almost on the same exact date of the shipwreck and it was just as stormy as I could have imagined. But it goes back to the early 1800s and it was a ship called the Isidore. And you know, typically people were pretty excited for ships to be going out because this was a money-making venture. You know, when they were building ships, imagine they were thinking about making their money back tenfold and all the places that these ships would go. So normally people were pretty excited about shipbuilding, but when they were building the Isidore, Nobody was terribly excited. And something definitely seemed odd from the very first day. Um, it was written about the air seemed to be very heavy. There was no whistling. There was no pleasant conversation. Essentially, they just had a job to get done, and it was to build the Isidore. As the days wore on and the shipbuilding was becoming complete, those who had signed on to be on the crew of the Isidore were starting to get a little bit nervous. Um, in fact, they were saying that they were seeing premonitions. Some of these premonitions included dreams of shipwrecks. One man said that he dreamed of seeing seven coffins, and in one of those coffins, he said he saw his own face. There are other stories about dogs howling wildly at night that hadn't previous to the Isidore being built. And people wondered, was there going to be some sort of ill omen that was going to hang over the ship as it had set sail? So there was a uh, man who was so superstitious about the stories that were being told by the other men who had signed on. Sailors, very superstitious back in the day. He decided that he wasn't gonna go. So he went to Captain Leander Foss and he said, I want out of the contract. Captain Leander Foss asked him why and when he said it essentially was because of all these premonitions, that wasn't enough to get him out of the contract. So he decided that the night before the Isidore was due to set sail, he was going to leave his house and hide in the woods of Kennebunk Port. And his wife was absolutely outraged. She said, if they find you, you can be imprisoned for getting out of your contract, which was a thing back in the day. It didn't matter. The risk of imprisonment wasn't even enough to get him to put one foot on that ship. So the morning came. It was a very cold November morning. It was said that the wind was blowing in out of the northeast very gently in the morning, but by noontime, the wind was starting to reach a screeching gale. However, the Isidore was due to set sail. And as people gathered around the Isidore, it was almost like gathering around a coffin as it was getting ready to set sail. There was just a very ominous feeling by the people in town. In fact, one of the crew members came running down to the docks and the other crew member said, oh my God, you almost missed the boat. And he was heard saying, I wish I had. So he climbed aboard the Isidore and the Isidore set sail with a load of ships rigging heading down the coast. And the storm really was blowing in. And sort of, you can sort of imagine just going from Kennebunk Port just down to Rye so Rye, New Hampshire was as far as they made it, and Captain Foss decided, you know what, maybe this isn't such a good idea. And he decided to turn the ship around and head back to port in Kennebunk Port. So as he did, he ran into this area here. So this is just outside the cliff house, and it's the Bald Head Cliffs. And um, I took this photo at night just to show you how dark it truly is. I mean, obviously you can see the light from the hotel there, but look at these rocks that are there. So the Isidore, as it was trying to navigate its way right back to Yenabunk Port, it actually wrecked on the Bald Head Cliffs, which again is right where the cliff house is. Let me see if I can scoot us up here. So there is the Bald Head Cliffs right there. And if you sort of imagine the remnants of the ship just being right in this little cove right here. And here's the cliff house so you can see right in the middle where the, the water comes in right there. So that's where the Isidore was found. And what washed ashore 
were seven bodies, just like the man had dreamed about, including the man who had the dream. It was such a horrifying scene to see this down on the beach that several ministers were brought in. And it was especially hard for family members because most of the men who were crew on the Isidore were under the age of 30. In fact, more than half of them were under the age of 20. Captain Leander Foss was just 36 years old. The captain was lost at sea. His body was never recovered. So, as I mentioned, this story happened back in the early 1800s. As early as 1870, in Maine newspapers were stories of the ghost ship, the Isidore. And it was described as sailing from Kennebunkport, Maine, all the way down to Rye, New Hampshire, with tattered sails and a phantom crew at the helm. Whenever another ship tended to approach it, it just seemed to sail off into the mist. And there were a lot of theories as to why there was even a ghost ship at all. Some people wondered, you know, because they couldn't finish their task. Is that why they were out there? Maybe their spirits couldn't be at rest because they didn't want to go. Um, I remember reading in one of the newspaper articles, uh, the gentleman who was writing it said, it doesn't matter if the story of the Isidore being a ghost ship is fiction. He said there are certainly enough people now who have said that there is a ghost ship that is sailing the coast. He said we have incontrovertible facts that people just would not make up seeing this ghost ship. So this is a memorial plaque. It looks like a gravestone, which is in kind of bunk port, and it doesn't really tell you that, I mean, it tells you the story, but it doesn't really tell you the depth of what had happened out there. So here you can see Captain Leander Foss at the age of 36 was lost in the wreck of the new bark, the Isidore, together with all on board, 15 on number, on Cape Natick, November 30th, 1842. May this event God sanctify and thus prepare us all to die, that when we leave this earthly clod, we may be blessed and dwell with God. So um, this is a big tablet stone there, but um, unfortunately, his body wasn't recovered. And strangely enough, I went to the Brickstore Museum in Kennebunkport because I wanted to find the graves for the crew members who did wash ashore. And all I could find is that they were buried at a crossroads in Kennebunkport. And when I was given those coordinates, I went to that crossroads and it was in the middle of a neighborhood. And there was nothing there but a few fieldstone markers and no further information. So I'm not really sure where the rest of the crew is. If I just go according to that map, that's where they are. But there's really not a lot more than that to tell us. So maybe that might have something to do with it being a ghost ship because their graves aren't being fully acknowledged. Again, I'll sort of leave that for you to decide. So here is a, a view looking out, um, of course, the river as you're leaving uh, Kennebunk Port. Roxy, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Do they know what happened to the man that went into the woods to hide? He, he didn't go. And he was fine. So, I mean, uh, his premonition, I'm sure everybody was like, hey, you might have been on to something there. So, yeah, he was, uh, he was totally fine. And he wasn't imprisoned or anything. I mean, clearly there was a, there was a, a lot more at hand. All right, so one of my other favorite coastal stories, we're gonna scoot up the coast now a little bit further to Cape Elizabeth. Um, Cape Elizabeth is just outside of Portland, Maine, and I had no idea of this amazing story, which there's a lot of different layers to the ghosts in it. Um, I received a call from a hotel called the Inn by the Sea, which is located um, along Route 77. So here you can sort of see as we make our way up the coast where we are here. And I was just really amazed and um, at this, this very heartbreaking story relating to this woman named Lydia Carver. And we're right in the same days of the Isidore. We're back again in the early 1800s. So this is a portrait of Lydia Carver that hangs at the Inn by the Sea. And Lydia Carver was heading to Boston with her bridal party um, on a beautiful July day to be fitted for all of their clothing. And they made their way down to Boston. It was, again, a beautiful day on the way out. But on the way back, a severe storm had blown in. And her father was actually the captain of the ship. And as they were navigating their way back up the coast and making their way up to Cape Elizabeth, unfortunately, it got to be very difficult to even see the land that was in front of them. And much like we were talking about 
with Boone Island, they just couldn't even see it. So their ship actually wrecked on Richmond's Island, which is just off of Crescent Beach right here. I'm trying to see if um, you can sort of see it here on the left hand side. So on the left is Watts Ledge. You can see that little ledge coming out of Richmond's Island. So the ship was trying to navigate around that and it went up on the ledge. So you can also see how close it is to the land. So some of those that were being, you know, essentially tossed about in the ocean, they figured if they could, you know, just get their wits about them, they could swim over to the beach. Unfortunately, the storm was so severe that nobody made it over to the beach. And eventually the captain's wife was washed off of the ship and he let go to go and save her and they were both lost at sea. So the next morning on Crescent Beach, it was a horrifying sight. So here you can see, again, looking off um, to Richmond's Island there from Crescent Beach. But in the morning, there wasn't um, a, a dry eye to be seen because there on the beach was the dead body of Lydia Carver and her bridal trunk and inside the trunk was the wedding gown that she was never going to wear. Um, this is the gravestone for uh, Lydia Carver, which is pretty amazing because it's actually hidden in the bushes um, just near where the ship had wrecked. I mean, you sort of kind of have to know that it's there. And I learned about it from the folks at the Inn by the Sea because they were amazed at the condition of this gravestone. If you compare it to the other stones in there, it's actually one of the older stones. And look at the condition that it's in. The folks at the end by the sea maintain that Lydia's spirit still takes care of the gravestone because it does tell um, the story of the shipwreck, which I'll try to, um, it's a little fuzzy here to see, um, but it was uh, July 12th, uh, 1805. And it does tell, um, again, the entire story of the full bridal party out there. Um, there were 17 people that were lost in, um, in the wreck of the ship, again, including Lydia. So let me give you uh, a view. So this is looking from the burial ground across the marshes and then down there is Richmond's Island and Watts Ledge. So again, it was just kind of strange that she was buried there up on the ridge. I mean, there was no hotel that was there in the early 1800s. And there are a few other people that are buried in, um, in this little country cemetery here. So uh, the Inn by the Sea had mentioned that they truly believed that Lydia Spirit was still around. Um, the inn opened up in the 1980s and oddly enough, they're a wedding destination. So what are the odds of that happening? And that Lydia just happens to still make the walk from Crescent Beach up to the hotel. So here you can see on um, the boardwalk that goes down uh, from uh, the back of the hotel here and that she's often seen walking up um, from the beach. And there's some interesting stories over the years that have come from guests to the Inn by the Sea who have had some strange encounters with Lydia. There was a couple who was walking on the beach and the gentleman had looked out to the island and he said that he saw a ship wrecking out on the island. It was sort of coming up between the mists and he was calling for his wife to come and see what he was seeing and he kept yelling for her across the beach and finally she came up and she looked out and she didn't see anything and he explained not only did he see something out there but he thought he heard the cracking timbers of a ship. So him and his wife went back up to the hotel. They went to the front desk and explained what he had just experienced. And the strangest thing, um, call it coincidence, if you will, the strangest thing was, as they were explaining the story to the staff, this gentleman's name was Mark Hardy, but his wife's name was Lydia Carver Hardy. What, what are the odds that his wife had the same name as Lydia Carver who perished on the beach? So they found that to be a, a very fascinating story and maybe again, there was a, a little bit more there. So here you can sort of see the walkway that goes down um, from the back of the hotel. There are stories that uh, brides sometimes have these odd occurrences. Here's a back of the hotel here at uh, Crescent Beach. So you can see the pathway where it comes out and the brides will tell stories of seeing a ghost bride walking through their suite. Uh, they've talked about having dreams, seeing floating wedding gowns, all sorts of strange things that they could not explain. 
Um, and when I asked the hotel where they actually got the portrait of Lydia Carver, they didn't even know. They had no idea where it had come from. They said it just sort of showed up one day. The cemetery that she is in is on the right hand side, just past that building that's right there. So I did an event at um, the Inn by the Sea, it's probably 15 years ago, and an older woman from the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society had come out and she had told me that back in the 1960s, um, her and her daughter were riding along Route 77, so this is right near the Inn by the Sea, and she said as they were driving past the field, they noticed that there was a woman standing on the side of the road with her hand placed on the back of a deer and she was wearing this white wedding gown and they said as they pulled up they slowed down and got a really good look at her and she was just standing there very silently and then they said as they passed her they looked in the mirrors and then turned around and she was gone practically instantly so I found it very interesting that not only is she at the inn she's on Route 77 and she's also down on the beach as well so a lot of people um, asking what my my favorite maritime story is and I'm just gonna uh, take a quick left turn and then um, I'll, I'll give you a really great local ghost story but um this I just have to share with you uh, Slooming Gray and his misfortune at sea um, it's a story that actually originated in Connecticut in 1865 um, Slooming Gray was a prosperous whaling captain from Lebanon Connecticut at 51 he took his wife Sarah on a voyage aboard the sailing ship the James Morey with three of their children the ship was off the coast of Guam after nine months at sea, and Sluman suddenly took ill with intestinal inflammation, and he died. Rather than burying her husband at sea, Sarah Gray decided to preserve her husband's body in a cask of spirit. So she actually put him in a cask of alcohol, and she wanted to take him home to be buried in this cask. The ship then turned north with the whaling fleet to hunt for whales in the Bering Sea. They encountered the Confederate ship, the Shenandoah. Captain James Waddell spared uh, Sarah's family death, but captured the ship and took it and the pickled captain to Honolulu, along with 222 prisoners that were placed on board. Sarah, the children, and the pickled captain finally made their way back to Connecticut in March of 1866. He was buried in Liberty Hill Cemetery, and according to local legend, Sluman was buried in his cask. There is no record of his wife buying a coffin or paying to have a carpenter build one. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to share this story with you, even though it's from Connecticut, there are two cases in the state of Maine. When I was researching my, um, my most recent book, which is on Maine graveyards, um, a little bit further north, uh, sort of heading up to uh, Castine, there is a story of two people who were out at sea, died at sea, and they were buried also in alcohol casks. So it's really kind of interesting how, why bother taking them out? We'll just put them in the ground as they were. So absolutely fascinating. I mean, you're out at sea, you don't have coffins. What are you going to do? All right. So let's get to our last story, which has a lot of different layers. And you might recognize this lighthouse, like I said earlier, we're gonna come back to Portsmouth for this story. So this is Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. Um, when I first started doing ghost tours a long time ago, the first ghost tours I was doing was actually um, as part of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. I was on the board of directors and we were trying to think about some sort of fun fundraiser that we could do. So I proposed doing ghost tours in uh, Newcastle, talking about the Isles of Shoals and things like that. And um, I had no idea how many ghost stories there were uh, on the coast at that time and how, again, the Coast Guard were going to be involved. The light station itself is pretty notable. Um, it was the first lighthouse station established north of Boston, Massachusetts in 1771. So it was one of the colonial lighthouses. And it was originally built at Fort William & Mary, which today is now Fort Constitution. You can see here um, in this image in the back that is Kittery Point right there. So the first lighthouse was actually built inside the walls of the fort in the 18th century. And when the cannon fire would go off, it actually broke the glass in the tower. So they decided to move the lighthouse out to its current location that you see here. And the second lighthouse was built out of wood in the early 1800s. It was um, 
uh, just as wide as the base that the current lighthouse is on. And it was actually quite a bit taller. But being so exposed, even at the end of the Piscataqua River, after about 50 years, it was starting to show signs of age and wear. So the current lighthouse that you see was built quite ingeniously. It was built right inside the second lighthouse. The cast iron panels were shipped down from Portland, Maine, and it's lined with brick inside. And when the construction was complete, they took off the shell and you have the light that you see here today. The building on the left is the oil house, and you might have noticed in the last picture, the door was actually on the oil house and it had just been restored. Um, about a year later, a storm surge came in and wrecked the, the entire um, restoration there and took the door off the building and the door was washed out to sea, never to be seen again. So even though, again, it looks beautiful and peaceful there, you just never know what a storm's gonna bring. Here we are standing on the walkway. You're looking out to the Isles of Shoals. On the left is Whaleback Lighthouse and on the right are some tankers. This is a look up inside Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. I used to love um, to spend a lot of time in the lighthouse and tell stories about it. And it's great just walking up that staircase and hearing the echo, let alone once you get to the top, um, the view is absolutely amazing. If you ever have an opportunity to go, I do recommend a visit. Um, they do open houses there um, for most of the year and it's really just a great experience overall. Um, however, I will suggest you probably don't go in the middle of summer um, in July or August. It is really, really hot in that lighthouse. And back when I used to do the history inside the lighthouse, the hotter it was, the shorter the history got. So um, this is a view from the lantern room looking down at the lighthouse keeper's house and you're looking over the walls of Fort Constitution in the back you can see the beautiful Piscataqua River. So it was, um, gosh, I want to say probably 2002, 2003. Uh, I really started to hear a lot of ghost stories about the lighthouse and even the fort itself. Um, that there were all sorts of spirits that were around. Uh, volunteers were saying they were hearing someone else climbing the spiral staircase while they were alone in the tower, um, noticing that there was someone else talking while they were hanging up Christmas decorations and they were alone. So there were a lot of stories. In fact, even the Coast Guard would say that there was a woman walking along the seawall here and they would see her from the tower there, so through the video monitors. So they'd send down a Coast Guardsman to see, you know, was there truly someone out there at the wall? Coast Guard would go out there and look, didn't see anybody, so radio back to the tower and say there's no one here. But the tower who was viewing him through electronics would say, she's standing right behind you. So the guy at the wall couldn't see her, but through the tower they could. Now, does the Coast Guard have a reason to make this stuff up? I don't think so. I mean, they're working really long hours. I totally get that. Um, but I really don't think there's a need to make up some of those stories because they have so many of them. So here's another view of the keeper's house. So there were just so many amazing stories um, going on there that we actually decided um, with permission of the Coast Guard to do an overnight investigation. And um, I did the investigation with a group called the New England Ghost Project and they're out of Massachusetts, um, Ron Kolek and Maureen Wood, who I've, I've known forever. And we decided that even though we had had some great experiences inside the tower that before we're going to leave that beautiful August night, we're going to go inside the keeper's house here. So we were up in the hallway there where you can see that fluorescent light. It was probably about two o'clock in the morning and the medium was channeling a spirit that was there. And she said the spirit was very friendly, someone who when you came to the lighthouse, you were like telling her story. Um, she just really enjoyed being there. She had passed fairly recently. So I was very interested and also very intrigued as to who she was channeling. Um, I had met some people uh, during my time with the lighthouse that I was trying to see maybe would there be a possibility, um, would they be there? So things started to get very, very strange um, a few minutes later when I started to ask some questions to try and determine who it was. And the medium was dowsing with a pendulum, which is a, a form of spirit communication as well as channeling. And um, I asked her, I said, you know, can you tell me anything about the spirit? She says, well, she's a woman, she's older. Again, she's passed recently. She's got a hand out and she's holding something in her other hand. So I'd asked her, I says, you know, well, what is she holding? Maybe I could figure out, you know, who this was. And she said, well, she's saying thank you. And I'm like, well, what would she be saying thank you for? And she said, well, she's holding flowers. And I'm like, hmm. 
And then I asked her, I said, you know, what kind of flowers? Is there more information I can get? And she said, I don't know, she said, but they have large pink buds. So for me, um, my, just all of my spidey senses were tingling in that moment. I, um, you know, I've always been a believer in ghosts and there have been these moments in my life where I'm like, there is no doubt there's spiritual activity out there. This was another one of those moments. So as she was explaining these flowers, um, it was really quite a moment because as soon as I looked at her and was about to ask my next question, she collapsed to the floor. A chair that she was next to, like one of these, was flipped over and she was completely unconscious and Ron had to pick her up and get her conscious again. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I can't believe what just happened. So um, these pictures here, um, that's myself and my uh, husband in 2003. And that wonderfully vibrant woman that you see there is Connie Small. And she was the last lighthouse keeper's wife at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. And I met her when she was 100 years old. In the picture on the upper right, she's 102. And she doesn't look a day over 80. Um, she lived at the Mark Wentworth home in Portsmouth, which is on my uh, list of super mega crazy haunted. There's a lot of ghost stories at the Mark Wentworth home. So Connie was absolutely amazing. She had so many stories about her life. And in fact, she wrote a book called The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife. Do you know if you have that book? Okay. It's, um, it's an incredible chronicle of what her life was like tending to lighthouses that were off the coast of Maine, rough, desolate stations. When she had come to Portsmouth in the 1930s, she was very excited because it was the first station she came to that actually had electricity. So she said she plugged in every electric appliance she could find, turned them all once, and went on what she called an electricity binge. She was so excited. Um, she was very, very animated. Uh, she really was a, a, a person that was living history. In fact, she had a quilt in her closet she never really thought a whole lot of. And someday she'd say, take it out. And there were all these squares in the quilt that chronicled a very interesting chapter in her life that she had done herself. Um, and that quilt now hangs in the main Lighthouse Museum in Rockland. And um, there's a little square on there that talks about when she was um, stationed up at St. Croix Lighthouse. And it was December of 1942, of course, during World War II. And uh, Washington had sent dignitaries up there to find the perfect Christmas tree to bring back to Washington, to put in front of the White House. And she said it was one of the most amazing things that they came unannounced at a time when nobody even was thinking about the holidays because they were thinking about the war and their relatives and what was going on. That, that really was sort of this beacon of hope, very much she related to because she dealt with lighthouses. So um, Connie was absolutely amazing. I could, I could go on with so many stories about her. But um, Connie passed at the age of 103. And though I'm not related to her, I knew her for a couple of years. And she was like, one of those people, you're like, I'm never going to meet anybody like this again. So um, I had gone to her funeral when she passed. I was the last person at her coffin. I had a picture of the lighthouse. I wrote my goodbyes. And um, on the way, I picked up a little something for her. Um, I knew the lighthouses that she kept on the island station, she'd bring out dirt on rocks to try and grow gardens. Um, she was very, very tenacious. And um, I knew that she was famous in her book for her rose gardens. So I had picked up, it was springtime, a bunch of pink tulips for her. And the medium had chronicled when she was standing there channeling that the flowers this person was holding had large pink buds. There was no way she would have known that. Um, and just again, to feel what was in that room, the electricity was unbelievable. I knew it was Connie and I know she's still there. Um, it's really just so amazing because there's no other place that she'd rather be. Um, she lectured about lighthouses on her own in her 80s all around the country. So I always sort of feel two things when I tell her story. First of all, like she's here alive again, just telling her story and bringing up her name. It's like she's with us. And yeah, there's no place that she would rather be. So um, that night, oh, let me go back a second here. That night, as we finished up, um, give me another picture of the lighthouse here, just to finish up that story. Um, we were getting in our cars, and it was like 3 a.m., and explaining to the medium that she had just channeled Connie Small, and but it had been a beautifully clear night. All of a sudden, this green fog enveloped itself around Portland Harbor Lighthouse, which the beacon itself is green. And this fog seemed to come out of nowhere. So we all went inside the lighthouse, climbed to the tower, looked out and saw this very amazing swirling green mist. And the medium said, this is how the spirits are saying goodbye. And again, it was just one of those very overwhelming moments. So um, 
I still I still sort of get goosebumps when I tell that story and there's still so many ghost stories that happen over at the lighthouse. Um, if you go, volunteers will tell you lots of stories, the Coast Guard will tell you lots of stories. Um, but that's sort of my, my personal experience over there. And again, she was absolutely uh, such a delight. Again, I totally recommend um, her book. It's actually uh, back out again. I think it's the University of New England Press that put out her book. Um, and there she is with a flying Santa with a card that I had made for her on Christmas Eve. Um, I really do miss her. Um, I take a lot of inspiration for the work that I do from her. Um, so I also have uh, books as well. I actually do have a few of them with me. My newest is The Main Book of the Dead. Um, I will be writing a book at some point um, in the future about lighthouses. I will be writing about Connie Small again. She's in my Haunted Horses book. Um, she's already up in Machias, Maine. Um, so I'm going to go up and visit her grave and pay my respects. It's been a very long time, um, but I know she's, she's still down here. So I also do a, um, a radio show you can find on um, iTunes, Buzzsprout, SoundCloud. Um, it's called Wicked Curious. So if you want to hear more ghost stories, you can definitely check that out as well. And um, it's been a very interesting evening technology-wise, but somehow we've gotten through it. Um, so you can find me also on um, Facebook and Instagram. Um, I'm Roxy ZW. And once again, I just want to thank the library for having me back and um, for helping me um, sort of, you know, share some of these stories, which aren't always frightening. Um, sometimes they just make us think. And I think there's, particularly with the Connie Small story, there's this whole notion that you don't have to be afraid, that maybe there is some essence of us that goes on. And um, Connie Small was alive with us for just a few minutes. So um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, stay spooky and have a great rest of your season. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>